Okay, uh, now we have a double bill. So, welcome to the show and welcome to Double Bill. Where we've got The Great Silence and we've got Tokyo Gore Police. Two very different, very violent genre films. Um, I thought it'd be quite funny to do both of them together. Now you might notice this is a weird box. Because this is a wooden box and this DVD. I think it's a German version. Uh, it's a wooden box. Um, which I've never seen in any other film. Um, so that's quite interesting to have. I got this in uh, Amazon a few months ago. It looks, I didn't even know it was wooden on a bunch, bought it for the film when it was a wooden box. This is a film I really want to have in Blu-ray but I haven't got it yet. But it's still great to finally see it because it's very hard to get hold of this one. Um, even though it's acknowledged as a masterpiece of the Spaghetti Western, it's very difficult to get hold of. It was made by Sergio Cabrucci after Django, another great film, but this is viewed as his masterpiece, and it is. It's, it's amazing, and it's really dark. I'm not going to spoil the ending of it, just to see it does not end the way you expect a um, spaghetti western to end. It does not end that way. The reason why I won't spoil it, even though it's an old film, is because it's very hard to get a hold of films, so I'm trying to encourage people to go watch it. It's really hard to get a hold of. So I really want to encourage you to say, okay, this is worth seeing, I should see it, but I'll try and talk around the ending. Right, um, it has certain facets of a normal spaghetti western. You've got a character called Silence, who is a uh, mute, who cannot talk at all, and he's going round right and wrongs, taking out villains, He's the fastest uh, gun in, 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 in that area. And the area is all filled with snow. The whole film set in snow. It's the middle of winter. There's no there's no um, escape from the snow. You've got a lot of uh, social unease. You, you, you've got all these uh, workers who have been basically turned into outlaws by the corporate, basically the businessmen. You know, the corporate businessmen. Because this is... The thing about um, Italian westerns is most of them are made by left wingers, <laughs> right? It's a very left wing biased genre, which is great because they really go after the businessmen. You know, it's uh, you're always hoping for if you get west, you're gonna have a, a left wing subtext, maybe a gay subtext, and lots of shooting. That's what you're gonna get, and it's gonna be really brutal and really cynical. And this film covers. Everything, it's really wonderful. Uh, you've got, um, you know, the silence who's going to be your hero who can't speak. You've got these workers who are suddenly out in the snow and they're causing trouble because they're trying to just survive in the snow. And if they ever try and go back to the families, they're going to get killed by bounty hunters. You've got Klaus Kinski as a bounty hunter working for the villain and he's a nasty, nasty person. I mean, Klaus Kinski played a bad guy, what a shocky. He's great in this film, he's just weird as hell. And he just enjoys his job a bit too much. I mean, what we've got Silence. Silence actually gets rid of his enemies by making them draw first by prodding them a little bit until they have to draw to defeat them and then kill them. That's his way of getting rid of the villains. If there's no bounty on them, he has to make them actually start the violence themselves. So he's a so you've got two characters, both of them who are clever and both of them who are know what they're doing, faced against each other. You've also got the wife of one of the people who are killed early on, of one of the people who were um, out in the land who had been uh, abused by the businessmen. She wants revenge on Klaus Kinski, and she's willing to hire Silence to take him out. And of course, um, as she can't pay them, they start a physical relationship. And everything sort of starts, there's also a, there's also a new uh, police, new policeman coming, a new sheriff arriving who wants to clean up the town and he realises it's much more corrupt and entrenched than he thinks it is. You've got a businessman who's manipulated everything. And that's the whole setup. I'm not going to get any further about what happens and I just say that what happens is really unusual and really twisted and wonderful. What's great about spaghetti westerns really is they go places that most films won't go. They're low budget but they take the idea from a low budget to actually mean 
they can be really cynical because this was set Italy after the war, after fascism of the Mussolini period. This is a, a country that has been through a lot. Has been through like collaboration with the Nazis, fascism, and, and political problems of its own even after fascism with the upside of communism and anti-communism and it, it, was a, it was a country with a lot of problems. You've got the, the North of Italy and the South of Italy not getting on with each other, you know, because the Northern sort of Southerners were a bunch of idiots and bred idiots. You know, it was that kind of problem. It's a it was a problem country. So you get like art film art house films like Bertolucci's, you get the like genre films like um, Argento's but you'd also get these spaghetti westerns that were influenced by the success of the Sergio Leone movies and they were rife, they were big profits and that's, that's an area where a lot of directors whose left wing biases could thrive because you're taking what is a, basically a hero versus villain cliche of the west from America then turning its head to show that they by sticking with bounty hunters rather than the good guys showing how corrupt the system is showing how awful the business people are like because I mean in American Western business people could be awful but a lot of the time though it'll be that's the price of doing business to, for civilization to emerge and in Spaghetti Western the businessmen are awful they're corrupt they will do anything to get make a buck and they will kill hundreds of people to do it without any problem that's what's great about Spaghetti Westerns they understand the corruption of business you know when let when there's no brakes put on it you know it's not like every business person's off it's like it's when there's no brakes put on uh, capitalism things tragedy happens it's the same way there's no brakes put on communism tragedy happens either side you, unless you put brakes on either side it's gonna go bad and so these are great films these are just terrific they're wonderful tearing apart of Capitalism gone extreme. It's just a wonderful, wonderful set of films, and this is one of the high water marks of it because it's you've, you've got a protagonist and antagonist who are both very good at their job, who are both um, determined to win no matter what. You've got people in this, people uh, around about them, all of whom have agendas, and all of whom will, are pretty ruthless to get their agenda across, and who will do horrible things. You've got some victims of these people forced out of their homes to live in the middle of winter and in the forest to starve to death or freeze to death. The whole problem of like business versus the rights of the people are in this film but not overstated, it's just like this is the problem and this is how bad it can go. It's not like rah 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 you have to become a communist or something, it's much more this is what capitalism can do if unchecked. And it's just a wonderful film. It's just directed beautifully. All the acting's just perfect for what it needs to be. Even Kinski's brilliant and put in the right context. Kinski can go way over the top sometimes, but if you're right direct in the right part, he can be magic. And this is one of the films he's magic in. I mean, it's pretty much his film. He's a villain, but it's, he kind of overshadows everyone else a little bit. But it doesn't overshadow them to the degree that it affects the film. It's, it's just overshadowing enough so that the villain's a real threat, the villain's really malicious and nasty and he's scary. That's what works with Kinski in this one. They don't let him rage over the top, they let him be the dominant figure so that the, the hero has, has some, a, a massive amount of cloud to deal with him. So that's a wonderful and the ending is amazing, the ending is stunning, your jaw will be on the floor at the ending. I'm not telling you what it is. The job in the floor for, in the last 20 minutes, this film, because it's not just the ending, it's what comes before the ending as well. It's just one to see, just go see it, just buy it. It's amazing. It's one of the highlights of 60s cinema. And it's not been, uh, you know, it, it's not been publicised enough. And also we can see Bullet for the General too, because that's awesome as well. Right, there's that one. Now we're going the exact opposite. This was a film with political beliefs behind it and it was actually kind of strained from modern times for gore. It's there but it's not gratuitous. It's there to show for a purpose. Tokyo Gore Police has grown a title 
and it has no political beliefs whatsoever. It says it does, but it doesn't. It's a comedy. It's a black comedy influenced by Sam Raimi in the Evil Dead 2. And it's basically taking like a Robocop futuristic cop mutation stuff, along with Cronenberg idea mutations of human body. Mix it in with the kind of Judge Dredd, Robocop, like fascist police state cops thing. I've, and they're hunting down these mutations. And that's all it is, is an excuse for lots of gore. And it's wonderful because it's utterly excessive but it's no political point, it's just funny as hell and just weirdly sweet amidst all the gore. So basically this girl whose father had been shot in front of her face to start with, the start of the film, has been raised by the cops to hunt down these mutations because it's been, it's been suggested to her that that's why her father died. She's got mental issues, she's been, she cuts herself a lot because um, her mother had those kind of mental issues as well and it's undiagnosed and it's a problem but they're just using her because she's such a good fighter. So it's this kind of fantasy of a spider by Buffy the Vampire of this woman who can beat all these guys up. I mean, doesn't take into account any like physical differences in size and strength. It's just a fantasy. But this film goes so over the top, you know it's a fantasy. It's not trying to delude you into thinking this is in any way realistic. This is a fantasy. It's a fun fantasy. And the fellow goes into the uh, conspiracy of what happened to her father and she hunts down these um, mutations and more she realises she's been lied to. Blah blah blah, you've seen it all before. Turns out the guy in charge of the cops is a, is a villain. You know that's coming a mile away. The film knows you know that's coming a mile away. The film doesn't even try and hide the fact that he's the villain. It's just like wait for her to figure it out and watch her investigate. And even then it knows the character's a bit slow in the uptake, so we're going to give you tons of gore around the side of these other characters as you watch them um, and deal with the problem. So, that, so while she's been a bit thick in the centre of the plot, let's have all these other plots flying around with tons of gore. And it works. There's just there's so much blood in this film. There's blood upon blood upon blood. It's just non-stop. It's utterly ridiculous. Every there's this one point where this guy f feels a bum in the, in, the, in the train. She grabs his hand, pulls him out of the train, drags him to a back alley, cuts his hands off, and blood floods from his hands. And she's got this umbrella that keeps her protected from the blood as he's going <gasps> as he's blood like three or four times his uh, blood supply pumps out of him during this sequence. It's wonderful. It's really ridiculous. That's the film's like. People rip parts of the body off, and because of this mutation, the the thing that the limb grows back as like a crocodile or something else or a human mutation like a Cronenberg type of monster but done as a genre thing and again it's utterly ridiculous but it's just fun to watch it's just enjoyable and this film was shot in two weeks really and it shows because the action is not that great but it's just how excessive it is and how much the enjoyment of making a film comes through it's just 100% pure pulp. That's all it is. It's highly recommended. It's 100% pure pulp. Do not expect any subtlety, any nuance, any detail, nothing. Don't expect anything that's film apart from lots and lots of blood. And it's wonderful for it. And it's complete opposite of something like The Great Silence which is using genre for political beliefs and for subtlety and for using all the genre constraints to make a point. This is the exact opposite. This is like we're taking what could be a political political drama about the police corruption and privatisation and things, throwing all that out and we're just going to use that as the hanging rod for tons and tons and tons of blood. So there's two different genres, it shows how genre filmmaking has kind of fallen away from political elements in the last 40 years, but also showing the fun side of it too. But it's kind of disappointing nowadays that a lot of genre films do not have a political side. It doesn't mean you have to hammer home a political message, it just means sometimes it's good to have something like Great Silence or Robocop or something like that or Starship Troopers which has like a political point and it's in, it's in the film and you can watch it, enjoy it and see there's something nuanced there. 
you don't really get that in a lot of films recently. A lot of the time they try and do it recently, it turns out to be it's half-baked because there's so much money involved in the film that they can't actually make any political points that's actually interesting. That's just the way it goes. You have to keep a low budget to do political stuff. And a lot of time the low budget director just wanted to do a lot of gore. Like in Tokyo Gore Police. So that's where we're at the moment in genre filmmaking. You know, we need some interesting weirdos who will annoy people. <laughs> and we're not getting that at the moment. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this rambling video. I hope you go and see both of these films. They're both first seen. One's a masterpiece, one's not, but it's very enjoyable. Well, I'll speak to you soon as I go towards the most offensive film of the week. <laughs> it's not Salo. It's not The Great Silence. Right, speak to you soon.